Let's go and see. That's not beautiful for a Mexican. <laughs> no, not good at all. Yeah. Not good at all. <laughs> or, or anybody else you might be mad at. Not a good day. Not, not a, a good day. It's not comfortable. <laughs> Thank you very much. The first day of the siege, Santa Ana approached on horseback, got a perspective on it, and hung a red flag, a symbol that there were no forgiveness. They would give no quarter. They sounded the no quarter bugle call used by the Mexican army. There'd be no forgiveness, and whoever they captured would be killed immediately. The defenders were bewildered. Bowie got sick. He was stricken down with a very high typhoid fever and had to be in bed. Travis remained as the only leader. They engaged in artillery combat. The distance is very short to San Antonio. Santa Ana calmly made arrangements, brought the artillery closer. He didn't have a siege artillery, so he couldn't knock down the stone walls. Santa Ana didn't have in mind to destroy and open a breach in the small fortification, which is the Alamo. Santa Ana wanted to organize a great attack with all his infantry. In the last days of the siege, the Alamo defenders and versions spread over the Battle of the Alamo told a story. Travers gathered the defenders, drew a line in the sand with his sword and said, this is the last chance. Those who want can leave. The others stay here and we are going to die. They took Bowie out of one of the little rooms where he was dying of typhoid. They took him out of the cot and put him here. Bowie said, I'm staying. The story doesn't hold up, like so many other Alamo stories that fall apart and tend to establish the heroic delirium of the Alamo defense. There was no such line in the sand. There was no Bowie coming on a cut to stay. Debates over the number of the Alamo defenders have been heated. Over the years, they have discussed how many defenders the Alamo had, as if 10, more or less 10, would make a difference. Just as they have exaggerated the number of soldiers in the Santana army, they also have reduced the number of defenders in the Alamo. The question is, how aware was Travis? who was already in command in the last days of the siege, that the reinforcements were not going to arrive. If you see the correspondence, the dates when it was sent and the dates when it was received, until the last days, he was waiting for the army that Houston was gathering to arrive. That's it. Maybe Santana wasn't the only victim of a delirium of grandeur who came here to demonstrate how to finish them off and get rid of the painful incident, that minor thing, as his memories would say, which had happened in Texas. Travis was also a victim of his delirium of grandeur. His letters continually repeat freedom or death. Travis had decided to become the first hero of the Texas independence. Mr. Travis Edley. Thank you, John. To the people of Texas and all Americans of the world, fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have to stay in continual bombardment cannonade for 24 hours and not lost a man. The enemy has to demand us surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are put to the sword if the fort is taken. I have entered that a man with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you, in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character, to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is receiving reinforcements daily. 
and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due his own honor and that is his own country. Victory or death? On the night of March 5th, Santa Ana gave the order to attack. He decided not to wait for the heavy artillery, which would have been the easy way to end the Alamo, but to launch an infantry attack. He decided to do it at night, maybe to avoid gunfire of long rifles and artillery that defended the Alamo with the risk that his own troops could shoot each other at night. Are you shooting this? Yeah. Oh, well, let me take my glasses off. <laughs> Martin Leo, ghost hunter. Hey, you want to do this? Listen. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, and you've been doing this research for many times? About 15 years. 15 years 15 of research years. about ghosts. We created a company here in town to do research about paranormal activity. Uh -huh. And our goal was to create new equipment to help people see ghosts. And you have some of that equipment uh, there? Yes. Can we see it? Sure. Okay. We can see the lab. I want camera with it. Okay. And have you seen once or twice? Oh, many times. Many times? Many times, yes. Ghost hunting is like fishing. If you go the same place every day for 15 years, 350 days a year, you're going to catch a fish. It's cold. The blue guy is a ghost. And where, where has this been it's taken? Over there in the window. I think his name is Antonio Fuentes. He's using a thermal camera. According to this theory, ghosts pick up energy from electricity, cables and ghosts have body shapes. Antonio Fuentes was arrested for theft and they put him in one of the jail cells. He was not here voluntarily. Ah. They threw him in jail for uh -huh. stealing the story that I heard. And we started calling his name, Antonio. And he actually started coming out of the thermal camera two or three times a week. Why the Alamo is getting so uh, eh, paranormal activity? There's a number of reasons that people died here. They died before their time. They died a violent little death. But that usually happens everywhere. That happens history, everywhere, no? all over, exactly. But why here? Don't worry, the camera okay, doesn't yeah, know, exist. I know, y'all edited it, but OK. Um, I just had another two with my tongue, OK. Okay, yeah, people die violent death, they die yeah. before the time. Oh, also, a battlefield is a place of great emotion, which is, we also, which is also something we find a lot of ghosts in theaters, because it's a place of great emotion. I like Hospitals. That. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like what he says about the emotional tension of this place and the abundance of myths and rather strange things, so to speak. We discovered about three years ago that instead of having everybody call him, just get the ladies to call him. And he comes out even more. If ladies called him, Antonio came out even more. The same also happens to some people I know in Mexico. If they call him lover boy, Antonio comes out. Now, the Salomo is giving off quite a bit of heat. Uh -huh. you see the if, if I put myself here, you can get it, no? Okay, I'm not a phantom. I know I'm not a phantom. Because you're but, red. <laughs> because I'm red. When I got blue, that means that uh, it's not a traditional heat of a, a human being, but... Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have you heard of the 666 on the Alamo? At 5.30 in the morning, according to Almonte's diary, the buggle sounded and the signal to attack, and the four columns began to approach. 
Soldiers approached the Alamo, and they finally had to walk 300 steps to get in touch with the walls. Three of the columns brought ladders to climb the walls. They decided not to attack the area of the fence, which would be the easiest way to access. He asked the soldiers to remove everything that could make noise. At 5.30 in the morning, the battle began. This is the north, right? Yeah. Duque was coming against the middle of the north wall, Travis's. The heroic death of Travis is truly accidental. After he shouted, here they come, the Mexicans are coming. He took his rifle, came here, peeked and banged. Travis is dead. The second column would attack from this angle. It was led by Cos, who was asked to participate because he was embarrassed about what happened in San Antonio. He asked to lead one of the columns. Sí. We're about 250 yards out there, probably about where the top of that hill was, except there was no hill. Yeah. Uh, they were, and Santa Ana was there with his uh, command. El, el, el Estado Mayor. The high command. Romero was coming against the east side of the fort. Romero was attacking probably cannon positions, which would have been on the back corner of the, uh, of the courtyard back here. The third column would attack from here. Romero led that column, which faced a wall of buildings, and there was also artillery. And the first column... On the church, right? Suddenly, you had men coming in this way, uh, Santa Ana throwing in the reserves, and, the reserves. and men coming over the wall there. And then Romero came back around this way and came over what was probably a very low wall back here. And took the cannon. And took the, took the, took the cannon there. Took and the, reverted the cannon. Well, no, no, because that no, was those, behind the long those. barrack. It, it would have been here. Where, where they reversed the camp. Sure, they brought him and down. The Bowie, the Bowie place, like, he has been told so much where he stayed the last minutes of his life. It would have been right next to the gate, uh -huh. based on the best information we have at this point, which is all the Mexican side, yeah. saying that it was... Uh, I had a friend who used to say, who was a very big historian in the Alamo, and she loved Bowie, and she said, James Bowie must have been an amazing man because according to historians, he was born in three different states and died in four different rooms. <laughs> That's good. But we've zeroed in on this one. Apparently, the, the goal for um, uh, Morales was taking the tambour outside the gate. Yeah, which was the important thing because and they were the candles there. It. So he came so down he here and over the, over the west wall. So we think Bowie was over here in this room, the hospital. Maybe he was already dead. Nobody knows. That's he was right. extremely sick. Yeah. That's why the Mexican chronicles said Las Cronicas Mexicanas. The Mexican chronicles say Bowie the coward was hiding under the bed. Well, he was either dying or he had already died of typhoid fever. They probably just walked into a room, saw a man lying on the bed, and bayonet him to death. So Bowie's heroic death also leaves much to be desired. You need to consider that the battle took place in the middle of the night, with soldiers badly trained. They were not misled, because the officers proved courage and desire. They started firing at each other, so the possibility of crossfire... The crossfire, it's immense. Sure. Once Santana's soldiers took the outer walls, they were probably thinking they had won the fort. And then all this started happening in the plaza. At the same time, there are people shooting from each of the rooms, defending themselves from the inside. So crossfire must have been terrible, and a good part of the Mexican deaths were produced by this crossfire. The famous Battle of the Alamo lasted an hour and a half, from 5 a.m. until 6.30 a.m., maybe 7 a.m. 
No more than that. In the end, there was not a single survivor, but some women, children and slaves. According to the mythical version, Crockett was surrounded by dead Mexican bodies. As years go by, the number of Mexican bodies grows, and they say Crockett defended himself by swinging his rifle. Finally, we would have a famous debate about whether De La Peña's diary was right, we would see what really happened, or one of the most viable possibilities. For a country that has no history, such as the United States, which has great difficulties connecting with history, this is one of the cornerstones of America's rotten heart. The De La Pena version of Crockett's death is most likely true. Mr. Peace, John Peace, from San Antonio, went to Mexico City with Carmen Perry, they brought the diary, he put it in the library here at the University of Texas, San Antonio. And there was an exhibition. And she translated it. And when people read about Davy Crockett being executed, boom. They get mad. Huge controversy. She got midnight phone calls. She got uh, a radio station called her at 7 in the morning. And they said, uh, we want to interview you on the radio. And she says, well, I can't talk to anyone at 7 in the morning. They said, you're already on the air. <laughs> so then Dan Kilgore, yeah. the president of the Texas State Historical Association, he, he was a professional accountant, but he, uh, he reviewed the literature. It's good that he was a professional accountant because he was not swayed by the myths. Yeah. He just looked at the evidence. The facts. And he said, the evidence, the documentary evidence shows me that Crockett very likely was executed here at the Alamo immediately after the battle. Well, then everything fell on him. He gets the midnight phone calls. He's called a communist. He's called a smut peddler. And then Bill Groneman's book appeared, claiming that the entire diary was a hoax, that the other documents were worthless. And when I was asked to review... You, you produced that um, new That's version. how I got into it. We were extremely involved in the, in the debate about how did David die. Right. In order to preserve the traditional version of that he died fighting seven Mexicans around him, well, you know the stories. It, there were seven in the beginning, 17 in the second version, right. 21 right. in the third. I have no idea how David Crockett died. I'm not saying that David Crockett died fighting. Maybe he was executed. <laughs> I don't know that. I do know that what they have been calling evidence all along is not evidence. Uh, this is new for you. You've been reflecting about this in these years, but at the beginning you started like with a hammer. Not really. You have to look. I read you. <laughs> I, but I never said I knew how Davy Crockett No, died. you never said that, but you were preserving the traditional version in a sense against the fake uh, documents that are appearing, etc., etc., right. no? Right. Keep, that on. Goes, that Keep on. I want your version, not mine. I have already mine in the book. That goes back to the question of what, is, what constitutes evidence and what, what is not evidence. But later on, the controversy grew up because they, they submit the document to proofs and they have a, a scientific uh, revision of the De La Peña manuscript. There have been... And written, the paper is correct. The and paper, the, yeah. the ink, the insect damage, the water damage, uh, there has been no scientific or forensic evidence that the De La Pena manuscripts What's are, for, are phony. To me, they're absolutely authentic. Now, that doesn't mean he's right about it. No, well, but, but nobody's the, right. But he's writing in Mexico in 1836, 38, 39. It's the real thing. How do we know? Yeah, you know, everybody just accepted the De La Pena thing because it appeared in book form here in Texas. They just accepted it as gospel truth. I went back to, well, did anybody actually take a look at this thing? Now, how do we know it's real? And no one, no one did. I was the first person to actually look at it with a critical eye. And your version? I think that the a controversial one we're talking about was probably created sometime in the 1940s. 
in the same collection, the same De La Pena collection of papers, there's a journal written by him. Every one of those pages are written in De La Pena's verified handwriting. Yeah. And the, None ink, of it, and the ink is okay, and the paper is okay? Yeah, well, the paper's okay and all, it's all old paper. But the controversial diary, not one page is written in De La Pena's handwriting. Uh -huh. And it's all different types of pa paper. So, but, but you were insisting in, on those days, the days of the debate, that De La Pena was a fake document. Yeah, I, I still believe that. You still fact, believe that? Yeah, but this, this destroys one of the columns of the building. The building is something like this in a Mexican perspective. He fought for freedom, David Crockett, uh, Travis, uh, Bowie, and the okay. secondary characters, and they fought for freedom, and then the heroic dead of the defenders we're, we're of the island. We're getting back to the issue of the willing sacrifice. Yeah. And so people are saying Crockett would never have allowed himself to be captured. Crockett would never have surrendered. I don't use the S word. I don't use the word surrender. But clearly, he was cut. But clearly, about half a dozen men, including Crockett, allowed themselves to be taken alive. That's no cowardice. No, we're That's not a cowardly man. And it doesn't say Crockett did anything <laughs> wrong. It doesn't say Crockett did anything uh, dishonorable or cowardly. No, well, the opposite, says, De La Peña says they, they shouldn't kill these people, no? What I approach it is, well, how do we know? You know, everybody just accepted the De La Peña thing because it... We Mexicans sit all over. <laughs> Why there is not such a debate about slavery? Which is a Soviet that disappeared in the American uh, historical uh, narrative about the land Yeah. No? Why there is not such a huge debate about land speculation, which is one of the most important issues around the Alamo? Why, uh, th those are my whys, instead of what happened, we'll never know how they would die. It's clear that we'll never know, no? no? And I agree with you with that. But the other, the other subjects, the other issues are, are not there. Slavery was always there. You know, it didn't have much to do with the actual battle itself. As far as land speculation and the legendary stories, personally, uh, that might, you could work that in to the story of Crockett's death because the first, the earliest three accounts of Crockett being executed all had, were all by people who had something to do with the New Washington Association which was a, a town they were trying to establish in East Texas on the coast. People had invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in this. When the Texas Revolution broke out, they stood to lose all that money if Santa Ana prevailed, because Santa Ana would kick everybody out. So once Santa Ana was captured, they had to make sure that he wasn't free to come back to power in Mexico. So they had to make him look as villainous as possible and one way that they tried to do this was showing that he murdered Davy Crockett, the most beloved character in the Alamo. Was it a conspiracy? No. Just they didn't. The pressure of. They didn't all just get together and decide to do this. It was a, an expediency. People already believed in the newspapers that Crockett was executed. In fact, some of the early articles about the Alamo says everybody was executed. The whole garrison was executed. So they, they latched on that, it's in my opinion, to make Santa Ana look as evil as possible. Well, it was easy because Santa Ana was more than evil well, as a character, no? Thank you very much. It's a well, pleasure talking with you. Likewise. Wish me luck. I'm going to present the book in Los Angeles Book Fair. Buenas suerte. Good luck. I need a Coke right away. The plaque says that the remains of the Alamo's men are in a tomb in the chapel located on the right side, 
of the San Fernando Cathedral. It's not true. In 1867, Houston ordered Seguin to try to recover the remains. According to what Seguin found, the remains were three piles of ashes. Ash is volatile, and it's not easy to find. He collected it, and they had a great military parade. He put part of those ashes in a small tomb and engraved coffin. This isn't the coffin, nor these their ashes. If we want to go deeper into it, we'll have to check the three men. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Seems to know a lot about this. I thought I knew a lot, but you also know a lot. <laughs> Many years talking about this. You, you weren't there. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the outside. You were in the inside. <laughs> The creators of the Alamo myth have always reduced the number of dead combatants. But what's really exaggerated is the number of Mexican soldiers killed. It is believed that Santa Ana fought with 1,500 men and the reserve. Some testimonies were glorified and the witnesses said there had been 1,500 or 1,600 casualties. This means all the combatants had been wounded or killed. It is most likely the figures given by the Mexican officers are true, and the casualties of the Mexican soldiers in combat were around 400 wounded and dead. Unfortunately, due to the lack of hospitals, a good part of those 300 wounded died in the following months. Everything has been such the subject of controversy. In addition to controversy, everything has been manipulated to try to glorify the defenders' resistance and to minimize their ability to defend themselves. It is meaningless anyways. It was a bloodbath, and Santa Ana's no quarter order was strictly enforced. It was terrible, a useless bloodbath on the Mexican side. Sam Houston's army pulled back under the pressure of the advance of Santa Ana's army. Although Houston's soldiers wanted to fight, he was somehow expending the battle as he approached, the northeast and the vicinity of the North American border. He probably was trying to cause a conflict between Mexico and the United States. Santa Ana, as one of the mistakes he made in his campaign, split the Mexican column and advanced with a vanguard that was scarcely a quarter of the Mexican army. They met here in San Jancito. Santa Ana set up camp at the edge of a stream. Small reinforcements arrived shortly after, and suddenly, under the pressure of its own soldiers, Houston decides to launch an attack. The battle lasted 18 minutes. The Mexican army was surprised. It had not entrenched itself. It was not active, even though they knew the settlers were a few meters away. It was obliterated in one sweep. Santa Ana ran away. He was captured one day later. It was the beginning of the end of the Texas War. As you see, the weather helps. This is the treaty they signed at Velasco, Texas. Santa Ana was a prisoner, and the treaty was the first step towards Texas independence. The treaty was never ratified by the Mexican government. As a de facto situation, Santa Ana signed the treaty and ordered the withdrawal. He was giving up Texas and giving up its independence. 
Santa Ana spent eight months as a prisoner in Texas, the territory he had helped become independent. Later, he was deported to the United States and he returned to Mexico in 1837. He was president of Mexico five more times before the United States declared war, resulting in the annexation of Texas by the United States. In December 1845, the American Congress accepted the incorporation of Texas as one of the states of the American Union. Then, the 1847 war, we all know the results. Mexico lost half of its territory. The soldiers who fought with Santa Ana in Texas War faced trial and all of them were declared innocent. They were honored with medals. They received salaries. Later they would be part of the army that would fight the U.S. in 1847 war and would lose it. En la guerra del 47 contra los gringos y la perdería. Esta es la triste. This is the sad story. Pobre país. Poor country. Tan cerca de los Estados Unidos. So close to the United States. Tan cerca de. And so close to the Triple Alliance. La Triple Alianza. Of military officers, priests, conservatives, and traitors. Ultramontanos, conservadores, vende patrias, traidores. Figures such as Santa Ana embody the extent to which the Mexicans themselves sometimes don't deserve the fate they have. Do you know what's going to be the problem with this program? Nobody will believe us. Our margin of incredulity will be extremely high. Kevin Young, one of the most interesting historians who has worked on the subject, says, there are no monuments without relics. But he says something even worse. If you put together all the relics of the Alamo, as it is also said about the relics of Veracruz, you could build something huge. Because the American way of understanding the myth tells you there is no myth without merchandising. It's the second to last, right? Because they won't let us in, the last one. We've arrived in the paradise of small notebooks. Have you got your IDs? They'll give it to you. I don't even use that. <laughs>